Hi guys, welcome to the introduction to Rust tutorial series. My name is Tensor. Today we're going to be talking about lifetimes and the module system in Rust. Also, if you'll excuse me, I kind of have a cold. That's probably why my voice sounds pretty scratchy. Also, I have a cat sitting next to me that's snoring. Hopefully that won't be annoying. All right, so to take a look at the module system in Rust, we want to create a library project. Now to do this, we just type in cargo new and the name of the project. So in this case, we're just going to call it test lib, all one word. Now here's what Cargo created for us. You can see here that we have our uh, cargo.tomo file, and then we have a source folder inside of which is a lib.rs file. And then there's some boilerplate here for setting up uh, tests. Now we'll talk about tests a bit more in another tutorial. All right, let's consider this example. So we have three modules here. We have mod A, we have mod B, and we have mod C. And you can see here we have function A and function B inside of module A, and then we have mod B inside of module A with function A and function B, and then we have mod C which also has function A and function B. This convenient way of sort of namespacing things with these modules here allows us to have multiple functions with the same names. We have this test function down here and we can sort of use it as a quasi main function. So for instance, say I wanted to call module A function B, I would write A colon colon B, and then I'd write parentheses of course to execute the function, and then a semicolon. You'll see here that we're getting an error and it's saying that function B is private. And that's because the functions inside of A are scoped from here to here. It actually stands to reason that module B itself is also scoped from here to here and that the functions inside of module B are scoped from here to here. So to get around this, we also have another keyword called pub. We can use this pub keyword to make functions public. So I've put pub in front of function A and pub in front of function B inside of module A. And you'll see here that the error goes away. Now what happens if I try to access module B? You'll see here that if I try to access module B by calling A colon colon B colon colon A, it'll tell us that module B is private. We need to put a public keyword in front of it. When we do that, you'll see that our error now says that function A is private. So we need to also put pub keywords in front of our functions inside of module B. So now we have access to module A, module B, and then the functions inside of module B. Now we only use this public keyword if we want these functions to be public. And of course there are specific instances where we write functions that we do not want to expose to a public file. Let's consider something else. So we have our modules here, A and B and C. Um, we can now take all of these and split them out into their own files. So let's actually do that. So now we've split all of our modules into our file system. So you can see here, we have our lib.rs, then we have a c.rs file. And this is basically like what we wrote before when we just had the module c. This has public function a inside of it and public function b inside of it. Then we have a folder called a, inside of which we have a b.rs file and then a mod.rs file. So this mod.rs file acts like our module A, and you can see here that we actually write pub mod B inside of it, because B, the actual module, is inside of our module A, and then we have our functions for module A inside of it. Then we have our B file, which has the functions inside of module B inside of it. And you can see here that I have to define the modules inside of the library, so Module A is defined here and Module C is defined here as well. Now the reason we don't define Module B here is because B, again, is inside of Module A, which is this folder here. And you can see, of course, that our test function isn't getting any errors from calling uh, namespace A and uh, the function B and namespace A and then namespace B and the function A. All right, so the rules for the module system in Rust are fairly simple. If a module has no sub-module, you should just put the declarations inside a file called the name of the module.rs. So C has no sub-module, so we just made a file called C.rs. Now, if a module does have sub-modules, you put the declarations for that module inside of a folder called the name of the module, so A, and then inside of a file called mod.rs, all right? So that's why we have this mod.rs file. This is actually 
where all of the stuff for module A goes. Now these rules also apply recursively, so if a module is named A and it has a submodule named B, then and B does not have submodules, then you should have the following files in your source directory like we have here. We have module A and inside of it we have mod and then module B. So now we've created a main.rs file and we can still access all of the namespaces that we've made public here. So for instance, if I want to get to module A, I can just say module A and maybe I want to get to module B and say the function A inside of module A and B and I can do that directly. I can also use the use keyword to make it so that we can actually import modules directly. All right, so let's consider this tree of modules. We have module A, module B, module C, module D, and then inside of it we have a function E. So to gain access to this, we would say A, B, C, and D, and then we'd say E, and we'd call that function E. Now, if we wanted to make this easier on ourselves, we could say, use a b c d and then put a uh, semicolon here and this would allow us to just call d e and so essentially by using the use keyword we can say all right well we don't really care about what's in namespace a b or c but we do want to be able to call things from namespace d inside of that so if there were any uh, sub modules inside of D, we could also gain access to them as well. All right, so enums also make their own namespace as well. So you can see here we have an enum called ex. And if we want to access it inside of our main function, we would just use ex uh, colon colon a or, you know, whatever type we want to access. Now say we only want to have access to a and c, we could use our use keyword here. And then we would type in ex colon colon, and then we'd open up some brackets and we'd put in the types that we want, so A and C. And this would make it so that we can call A and C directly from the EX enum without having to connect them to the namespace of EX. We can also use a asterisk to import all of the types. Now we get A, B, and C. And now this is what's called glob importing. Right, another thing we need to talk about is how the namespace system works with external libraries. If we were to say that this library that we created was an external library, the way we'd bring it in is by by using external crate and then the name of the library. The name of our library here is testlib. All of these crates inside of it, all the library files inside of testlib are namespaced to testlib as it's uh, the main root namespace. This module A here would be testlib A. Our other modules A, B, and C here are also namespace to test lib. So then we can use our use keyword here to actually gain access to the inside of our uh, modules as well. So we would use this kind of syntax if we wanted to import both the A and the B function from inside of module B here. All right, so hopefully this is enough for you guys to understand the module system in Rust. Now let's talk about lifetimes. So we've talked extensively about references we sort of left out an important detail, however, and that is that every reference in Rust has what's called a lifetime. Now, a lifetime is essentially the scope with which that reference is valid. Now, in Rust, most lifetimes of references are implicit and inferred, just like types can be inferred. And we can also annotate our lifetimes manually, just like we can annotate types as well. All right, so consider this example. So we create a variable here, x, and then inside of a new scope, we create a new variable called y, we set it equal to 10, and then we set x equal to a reference to y, and then we try to print out x. And you'll see here that we have an error here, and it's because y does not live long enough. When we're making this reference to y, the reason it's not working is because the scope for the variable of y ends right here. And we can really think of this like this. So you could think of this as lifetime A prime, and this has a lifetime of B prime. A prime is a longer lifetime than this B prime lifetime. Just as a side note, uninitiated values don't really work in Rust. We can write a variable like this without a value in it, but somewhere down the line, we have to put a value in it before we can actually use it in any function. Otherwise we will get errors because Rust doesn't have the idea of nil inside of it. All right, so the part of the compiler that deals with lifetimes is what's called the borrow checker. And so the borrow checker determines whether all borrows are valid. In this case, this borrow here is not valid for this scope. If we were to rewrite our example like this, you can see now this actually does work. And at no point does Y get dropped out of the ownership model 
while x still exists. So let's consider this function pr. It takes in a slice of string for x and a slice of string for y, and then it returns a slice of string. And we're saying if length of x is equal to length of y, then we return x, else we return y. We're getting an error right here already, and this is saying missing lifetime specifier. The problem here is that this return type gets created inside of this scope here. We can't guarantee that this bar, for instance, is going to exist long enough to be returned back to the main function. So how do we fix this? Well, we fix this by doing something similar to generics. So we use angle brackets here at the beginning of the function, and then we put in the lifetime specifier. In this case, I'm gonna put in a single quote and A. So you always preface the lifetime with a single quote like that. And then we have to annotate each of our types here with a lifetime. So X is going to have the same lifetime as Y, which is gonna have the same lifetime as the output. Now our error goes away. The reason our error goes away is because we're saying A and B have the same lifetime as the output string here, which means it should exist until the main function actually ends here. All right, so the way to specify lifetime parameters depends on what your function is doing. If we change the implementation of our function here to always return the first argument rather than one or the other, then we wouldn't have to specify a lifetime for our second parameter, for our y parameter here. If I was to delete all this and then just put x as our return value, I could remove this a prime from y here. When returning a reference from a function, the lifetime parameter for the return type needs to match the lifetime parameter for one of the arguments. If the reference return does not refer to one of the arguments, the only other possibility is that it refers to a value created within this function, which would be a dangling reference. If I was to say something like let a equal hello, and then our return value is a, if I go in here and I move our lifetime, then of course we're going to have a problem because A's scope and its actual existence only really matters until this closing bracket here. So by using these lifetimes, we're assuring that it actually has a longer existence and we won't have a dangling reference as a result here. All right, so up until now, we've had structs that own all of the data that they've had in them but we can also use references inside of structs as well. So say we have a struct here, A, and inside of it has a field X, which is a slice of strings, or a reference to a slice of string. We would have to now add our lifetime annotator here so that it would actually work. So as you can see here, we're getting this error because the lifetime is not specified. Now to do this, very similar to what we did with generics. So we'd put in the lifetime here and of course put it in here as well. So because our struct holds a reference, it needs a lifetime annotation, and we've specified an A lifetime here, so it works. So if we have two references inside of our struct, we can have two independent lifetimes as well. Say we had multiple partial functions that allow us to fill out X and then Y independently. Uh, this could be useful in those cases. It's important to note that every reference in Rust actually does have a lifetime annotation. So even if we don't specifically put it in there, it still exists in the compiler. And this is what's called lifetime inference or lifetime illusion. So illusion rules don't provide full inference if Rust deterministically applies the rules, but there's still ambiguity to the actual lifetime, then we have to explicitly state the lifetime. So the compiler applies illusion based on a few different rules. For instance, if we have a function with one reference, then it will get exactly one lifetime parameter. So if our AB function here only had one uh, reference instead of two, it would get one. Because it has two, it gets two. If it had three, then it would get three and so on and so forth. If there's exactly one input uh, parameter, that input, that lifetime is also assigned to the output. So uh, for our function A here, you can see that uh, S here has the um, a lifetime parameter and the output also has the same lifetime parameter. So this is redundant. We don't actually have to write this because the compiler will automatically infer all of this for us. Finally, if there are multiple input lifetime parameters, but one of them is a reference to a self or a mutable self, then the lifetime of self is assigned to all output parameters. So naturally, based on that last rule, we know that we can also assign lifetimes to methods. So you can see here, we're adding it to the implementation block for A, 
We're just saying that we want to pass in the uh, quote a lifetime for a. Now you can see here that this function here is taking in a reference to self, so we don't actually have to specify the lifetime explicitly. Basically, a lot of the ways that we write lifetimes in Rust are very similar to how we would write a generic in Rust. Now there's one more important lifetime that we haven't really gone over, and that's the static lifetime. So this is a special lifetime which will last the entire duration of the program. Just look at this uh, variable s. We put in this static keyword with a uh, single quote here for the lifetime, and this string will last as long as this program is running. So most of the time you really want to avoid using the static lifetime unless you absolutely have to because it can really slow down the speed of your program if you have a lot of them. Now, if you can't find a solution to a potential dangling reference, then you probably should use the static lifetime. All right, guys, I know this is a fairly code light and more theory heavy programming tutorial, but I hope you were able to understand all these concepts. Anyway, if you enjoyed this tutorial, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, then feel free to leave them in the comment box below. And if you dislike the tutorial, then by all means, downvote it as much as you'd like. Have a good day, guys.